this week's Torah portion starts off with someone going to war against his enemy. It starts off, Ki milchama al oivecha. When you go to war against your enemy, and then it goes on to say, Unasano Hashem Elokecha biadecha v'shavisa shivio. You go to war, God hands your enemy to you, and you take spoils. Vera'isa b'shivya, and you see amongst the spoils, Eishas yifas toar, a beautiful woman, v'choshach daba, and you desire her, v'lakach dalacha le'isha, and you take her for a wife. And then uh, it talks about what steps are required before she can, in fact, be your wife. Step two. I'm calling it step two because the Gemara learns it this way. If a person has two wives, one of them who he loves and one who he does not, and he has children from both, and the child of the one that he doesn't love is his Bahor, he he has to recognize his Bahor and uh, treat him appropriately. And then um, in the next episode, it talks about a person who has, or a couple that have a rebellious son. This rebellious son has to qualify. He has to do certain things at a certain point in his life. He's very young. If he does these things, he's then he's brought to the court. The court determines he qualifies to be a rebellious son, and he's put to death. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, the Talmud says there never was one of those rebellious children. There never will be one of those rebellious children. That this is a scenario that is theoretically possible, but practically it's not going to end up happening. The Gemara also in a different place says that these first three cases are written as they are because there is a scenario where, in other words, this is not an unlikely scenario that a person who takes a captive woman, even though it's permitted, a, per a person takes that captive woman, the likely stage two is there's going to be strife in the house. He's going to have most, they're assuming he was already married. Now he's bringing this woman into the marriage. There's going to be strife into the, in the house and, it, and it's going to end up bleeding into the next generation and finally leading to a child who is a Ben Sorer Umore, is a rebellious child. So episode one leads to episode two, or scenario one leads to scenario two, scenario two leads to scenario three which strongly suggests that a mistake is being made in scenario one, which is somehow being continued or exacerbated in scenario number two, which is leading to scenario number three. Now, if scenario number three never happened and never will happen, so this warning is not about something that you are really expecting to happen, which means that you are free to learn this figuratively. A lot of times you can learn things in the Torah figuratively and commentaries do learn it figuratively. Uh, we have this notion that the Torah is written on many levels and that it's meant to be understood on many levels. We have the notion of pardes, which is the orchard. Pei, reish, dalit, samach. Pei standing for pshat, which is the surface meaning of the of the of what the Torah is saying. Then there's remez, then there's 
what is being hinted to in that, like coded lessons from the from the the shot, and then you have drush, which is the medrash, and then you have sod, which is which is uh, stuff happening on the Kabbalistic level. So you have different. You always have that with everything, but here, if they're telling you that this thing pragmatically is not going to happen, now you're really encouraged to learn it on on different levels. Uh, this thing on different levels. All right. So again, we have this person going out to war, and while he's out to war, and they're taking in the spoils, he makes mistake number one, which is. He sees some, uh, a woman, he and he takes her. That's mistake number one. Mistake number two, he has, uh, he he's uh, at least the way the Gemara is understanding it. He now has brought her into his family. There is family strife, and he's being warned against favoring one over the other. It suggests that there is this family strife going on and somehow during that family strife he is making mistakes that are now leading to uh the the third one which is the rebellious child okay so i because we are free to learn this um allegorically metaphorically i am going to suggest a path, which is nothing to do with a soldier actually going to war, but is talking about us. I am engaged in a war with my enemy. I'm engaged in a war with my enemy. He said, when you go to war with your enemy, and God, you are victorious. Hashem hands him to you in victory. And now you are there and you see something and you want to take it. So I would like to suggest the following. Who, whose song is that? Should I stay or should I go? Should I stay or should I go? The Cure. The Cure? And maybe. Yeah. Ooh. Should I stay or should Ooh. I go? The Clash. The Clash. The clash. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. You're more, you're, you have much more value than just your encyclopedic knowledge of music. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So this is often uh, a question that we are faced with. Should I be here or should I go there? There are times when in, in the Torah, people were told to go, like Avram, he was told, lech lecha, go, I want you to go. Um, ya Yaakov is told he has to go. Yitzchak was told to stay. That there's a in the book Duties of the Heart. There, there is a story about a wise man who goes on a journey of discovery, and at one point he meets another wise man and the why and the other wise man says to him whatever you were looking for you know this already you know that whatever you were looking for you you can find where you are mm. you don't have to go somewhere in order to get it there's a Hasidic story that is surprisingly similar to the alchemist. I, I feel like whoever wrote the alchemist must have heard this Hasidic story um, about a man who has a dream <clears throat> and 
in the dream, <coughs> there's this bridge and he sees it very clearly. He has a real like vivid image of the bridge and <coughs> underneath that bridge is a treasure. And, and this dream repeats itself to the point where <coughs> he decides that he's going to travel to find this bridge so that he can get the treasure. <coughs> so he asks around, he asks people around because he describes the bridge and some of the landmarks around the bridge to people. And he, one person suggests maybe somebody in this place will know and somebody suggests somebody in that place will know. And finally, he gets to where this bridge is and it looks exactly like in his dream. The problem is there are soldiers that are patrolling the bridge. There's no way for him to get to where the treasure is supposed to be. So he waits, he hangs out there every day, waiting, maybe there'll be a shift change or something will happen and he'll be able to go, but never happens. And he's there day after day after day. And finally, a soldier sees him and the and the soldier um, and the soldier approaches him and he asks him, "What is he doing? Why is he there every day looking at the bridge?" <coughs> at this point, he decides there's nothing to lose because he's <laughs> they're not leaving the bridge. So he just tells mm. the guy, "He said I had, I had this dream, a vivid dream, and." <coughs> In the dream, there's this bridge, and under the bridge, there's this treasure, and this is the bridge from my dream, and I came here to dig for that treasure, but you guys have been patrolling all the time. So the soldier said, that's, that's crazy that you've been having a dream like that, because I've been having a dream that there's this house in this village, <coughs> and in that house, buried underneath it, is a treasure and he starts describing the house and the area around the house and it's this guy's house so the guy then goes back to his house digs under the house and he finds a treasure the treasure's been there it was always there he never in other words he never needed to leave in order to find the treasure there's a there's a gemara one of the uh, most wonderful agatas in the uh, Gemara, one of the most wonderful agatic sections in the Gemara is about King Solomon needing this worm for the construction of the temple of the base of Mikdash, the Shamir worm it's called, but he doesn't know how to get the worm and he's told to he, he, he strategizes uh, to, to to ask the demons, maybe the demons know, and um, the demons say they don't know, but the king of the demons <coughs> does. And so they capture the king of the demons and they bring the king of the demons back to Shlomo for his, uh, while you're over there, I'm gonna grab so so or, or there's that Diet Pepsi oh, over no, there. Welcome. I would take it. I was going to get up and get it. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. I should have just got it, man. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, so Shlomo sends his person, Benayel Ben Yehoyada. He goes, he captures Ashmedai and he brings him back. As he's bringing Ashmedai back, there's all these events that happen on their way back. There's sometimes when he's crying, there's sometimes when he's laughing, the, the demon, the king of the demons. So there's this one point where he's laughing. There's a magician and he's doing these amazing tricks in front of you know a large crowd and Ashman is just cracking up and so at one point at one point Benayo asks Ashmedai what was going on like as we we're coming back there's one place we cried there's one place you laughed there's one place so what what was going on so he had an explanation for each one but the laughing one with the, was with the conjurer and this guy was doing these tricks in front of everybody and he said right underneath that guy 
is a massive treasure. He presents himself as this incredible sorcerer and conjurer. There's a massive treasure right under his feet. He is clueless. He has absolutely no idea. He thought that was hysterical. Um, so there's so many times where this message is being presented and reinforced that you don't need to go anywhere. Whatever it is you're trying to resolve, you can resolve it right where you are. You don't need to go out. And yet there are times where people are told to go out, like Avram. Avram's told Lech Lecha. Avram, in order to realize his destiny, has to leave. He has to go out. Yaakov has to go out. Yitzchak does not. The Jewish people have to go out. There's, there's some times where you, you have to go out. And then there's times when we're being told that you don't have to go anywhere, that the solution is always here. Rabbi uh, Rebetzin Feige Torsky's father, she, rather, Rabbi Torsky and she uh, would, would quote him as saying, he's always excited about a trip. And then he realizes he's going to be there. <laughs> There's a part of us that think if I could just, when I go over there, I'm gonna have a great time thinking that I'm gonna leave behind all the junk and all the baggage and all the whatever. <clears throat> and that's part of the excitement. I'm gonna go this place, I'm gonna go that place, I'm gonna go this place and all that stuff gets left behind. And then when I get there, I realize it came with me. It's the, that you don't, you don't leave the stuff behind. It's always with me. That's the negative version of it. I like the treasure version, which is very positive. You know, finding the treasure. Even Dorothy in Wizard of Oz is told that the secret's always been with her. It's always been in the ruby slippers, the way to get, uh, the way to get home. And even home, you know, the idea that she just she, you know, she wants to go back to uh, to where she was. <laughs> right. Um, so what are we to do about it when we're in our circumstances? So what, what are we to do? Do you stay or do you go as the clash wrote it or sang it? I'm assuming they wrote it too. That kind of song is not written by Carol King. <laughs> I don't think. Um, so I would assume, putting it all together, that the rule of thumb is to assume that you don't have to go somewhere else to find happiness and joy and resolution to, to your issues. That typically, the general rule is that whatever you need to resolve, whatever conflicts are happening, are here. And whatever you need to grow are here that you don't need to go somewhere else in order, in order to grow, in order to, to solve your, your issues, in order to resolve your challenges, that whatever you need is here, <clears throat> generally, unless God tells you to go. If God tells you to go, then you gotta go. And there are times in our life where it does seem like God is telling you to go. I remember I had a deal with my wife about living in Israel. We met in Israel and we lived in Israel as a couple for 12 years. Our kids were born there. And at one, but my deal, the deal was if she ever felt like life was getting too difficult in Israel, then, and she wants to move back, we can move back. So at one point she gave the signal, <clears throat> but I, I remember talking to Ramosha Shapiro about it. And he said, she wins. And, uh, and so we, we came back here. There are times like that where, where all signs point to going and then it, it is right, but if it, mostly it seems like it again, if you look at the preponderance of direction that you get uh, throughout 
the Talmud and Midrash, etc. It does, and from rabbinic writings, it does seem for the most part the answer is st- is here. Somehow the answer to everything is here. Everything I need is here. Every once in a while, there's going to be an exception to it. Now, let's say you, for whatever reason, need to go out. You need you need to go out in in order to solve some challenge. In this case, a war with your enemy. You have to go out. When you go out, when you go out, in this case, it's a battle with the enemy. You're going out and and you have to go out. You have no choice. You have to go out. You're in this situation. And you've been successful. There's a way of reading this that what it's saying is let it just be that. Do not indulge. <clears throat> In other words, you had to go out for a particular reason, whatever the reason is. Going out is not the standard. It's not the standard. The standard is being here. But let's say you did have to go out. Now, going out to another place, another circumstance, once once you've gone out and accomplished what it is that you're supposed to do, then you go back. Avraham is not you know, is on some kind of rare journey where he's traveling and traveling and traveling. But for most of us, the going out is something that is an outlier situation, but it happens in our lives. But when you're doing it, you have to be careful that you do it for the reasons that you need to do it and that you don't indulge. Once you're out there and you start taking pretty things, in other words, you're you're now out there looking around and taking what you desire instead of dealing with whatever it was that you're supposed to be dealing, now you are in danger. You are in danger. And when you bring that back with you, <clears throat> that is the seed of one trouble after another trouble after another trouble. Going out, this kind of going out. So what would be an example of this kind of, of um, going out? So let's say... Let's say I have, <clears throat> I live by a certain code. I live by a certain code. <laughs> and it's important to me. And I follow it with discipline. But I get to a certain place and I have to veer from that code <laughs> it, it could happen in, in a halakha, in a halachic situation it could happen it's it's uh shabbos and one of my family members is not well so i'm allowed to uh to break the laws of shabbos in order to take care of that 
person, drive them to the hospital, <clears throat> etc. I've left my routine, my code, but I'm doing it because I'm supposed to. I'm, I'm out there. But now that I'm out there, I have to know personally that it is a sort of dangerous place to stay. If I go there, I resolve what it was that I was supposed to go there for, and now <coughs> I'm done, then I go right back. And I go right back to my code. Uh, if, I, if I have, um, again, there could be times where I have a way of living that wasn't healthy from the beginning. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something where I'm resting I'm, I'm, I'm living within a, a vibrant system, but I have to step out of it. When, when I step out of it, and, and it's the right thing to do, when I step out of it, <clears throat> I have to be on guard to just stay out of it for as long as I need to stay out of it and then to come back in. This is so easy to misinterpret <laughs> because it's, it's not for many of us it's hard to be self-aware enough to know where here is and what is a healthy kind of here for me and where and and what is a, a healthy routine and what is a healthy system? It's, it's not so easy for me to know that on my own. It takes friends and mentors sometimes to either affirm that what I'm doing is that or to guide me to make some changes in, in my own situation uh, till I get to that place. But let's say I get to that place, even if I'm in that place, let's say I have a system, it's completely built on Torah values and halacha. Everything is in place. E everything's in place. And then a challenge comes up. And, that, and in that challenge, I'm asked to go out of it, to leave it. It can happen. It, it can happen that, I, that I'm being told to leave it. That, that I have to leave it. So there, there is a potential, I, I have to. In this case, it's an enemy that I'm doing battle with. If I don't do battle with this enemy, they're gonna kill me. I have to go and do battle with them. But, but I have to be very careful when I'm doing that to do just that <clears throat> and then to come back. If I get greedy, my my original my original reason for going out there was had a a limited purpose if i if i start being there and going you know now that i'm here i should do this and i should do that i should do this and i get greedy and i want to take more when I come back, that is the seed of trouble that can lead to one trouble that leads to another trouble that can lead to another trouble. Mm -hmm. That the, you, I, I got I to gotta go there for whatever it is I got to go there. When I've achieved the, the thing, I got to leave and come out. There are people, I'm not saying this is the case, but you hear this kind of, I don't know if it is or not, but you hear this language about going into Gaza. When you go into Gaza, and you're doing it, and don't get greedy. In other words, you went in there, you had an objective. Once you've done your objective, you leave. But if you if you get greedy once you've got your objective and you decide to take more than whatever your objective was, so some people could apply to a situation like that. But we could apply it in our in our own situations. We make an exception to a lifestyle or to a, a plan or to a rule. We make an exception. It makes sense to make that exception. And then when you're out there, if you're out there, 
and you get greedy. And then you decide you're going to spend more time or do more and take more than it was. Then when you bring that back into your system, it one thing, it can affect one thing and then the next thing and then the next thing. Um, Yeah, that would be um, another point of wisdom. Stick to the grocery list. Or as I call it, do your business and right. leave. Right, or people who go to casino. I mean, these aren't the big, important, oh. massive ones, but there are people who go to casino and they, they have a thing. They say, if I make, let's say, $1,000, Walk I'm away. walking away. Yep. Right. This, These are in the ballpark of the kind of things that we're talking about, but this can also have to do with issues of the heart and et cetera, that um, even at discipline. Yeah, it can happen in divorce. Uh, I, I have friends who have, I remember having a conversation with them at the beginning of at the very beginning of you know the divorce proceedings and then they said you know i'm going to try to make as amicable as possible and i'm going to try to be as understanding as possible mm -hmm. then there's fighting back and forth and all that kind of stuff but also they get to a point where the lawyer starts whispering in the ear mm -hmm. you can get more i can help you get more and then and it's just so hard to stay true to your objectives when you when you went in when somebody's saying you can get more uh, during that during that thing, but that to get more the cost of that to get more it's just it's never worth it. It's never ever worth it. But we once we're out there, we're we're lost. If you if you I have to make the if you say I'll make the decision when I'm out there, you're not, you're done. You're never gonna, you're not gonna make it. You you're you're lucky if you can keep a decision you made before you went out there. But like somebody will say, you know, they'll go with a friend. I'm telling you, if I if if I'm if I'm up a thousand, I'm leaving the table. You have to make me leave the table, you know, because they already know that it that it how hard it is even if you made the decision before, like you're coming up with all these things when I'm out, because I stop being able to think straight when you're, when you're out there, it's the worst of all situations. When you're in war, you, you can't think straight. There's so many emotions, so many, everything coursing through your body, fear, anger, greed, blood, lust, all these things are going, are coursing through you. And there's no way you can make a smart decision about something that is going to be with you for the rest of your life. But, and, but uh, unless you like prepare yourself beforehand that when I'm going out, I'm going out for that and then I'm coming back. And uh, in, in so many areas, this matters. Going out should be a rare decision leaving that leaving here wherever here is leaving here it, it should be an outlier kind of situation but when i need to leave here i i need to have like something in i remember coming back to america for vacation Guys would say, like when you're in yeshiva. So I came back for, I lived in Israel for 17 years. I came back almost every year, well, except for the end. I must have come back to America 15 times at least. Let's say 15 times going back and forth. So there are all sorts of achievements that a yeshiva bacher has when he's in yeshiva. He's learning a certain amount of hours a day. He gets up for shachris. He's at every davening. He's 
trying his hardest to have proper intent at every davening. He's, he's learning hours and hours a day, covering all sorts of ground. And then they're going to go home for vacation. Every yeshiva boy, boy says to his friends and his teachers, when I go back, I'm going to have a set time of learning. I'm going to be at every minion. I'm not going to watch television. I'm not going to waste my time with this and that. And then you go back. That lasts about six hours. And before you know it, you're on the couch. <clears throat> All your plans are done. My son, Sruli, uh, uh, um, made a thing that he's not going to sit down on a couch. One year he did this. He, he didn't tell me till afterwards. It had nothing to do with me. It was something he made while he was in Israel. He, he, he's not going to sit down on a couch until he has set up a study partner with him to learn with every day. And he actually didn't do it for like a day. He wouldn't sit on the couch and I wasn't sure why he's doing it. He only told me afterwards that he made, this is the kind of crazy things that you're doing, but why are you doing it? Cause you know where you're going. You know, you're going back into this thing. You're leaving the world of the yeshiva. You're going out and you're in trouble. If you, if you don't just go for what, what it is that you're going for and come back. Why are you going back to America? To see your family, to uh, to see your friends, to get a little R and R. But you're going to be learning. You're going to be davening. You're going to be doing whatever. <laughs> then you go there, and before you know it, you are indulging in all the pleasures. You're having every flavor of ice cream you missed in Israel, every type of pizza you missed in Israel, every type of whatever. And then you barely make it back. <laughs> it's that, I mean, and again, this is a relatively small kind of thing, but it, it is, uh, and there's, there's much bigger, you know, for some of us, there's much bigger challenges that await once we're out there. There was a, I remember there was a, when COVID, not COVID, what chance do I even have? I don't have much of a chance. It's already difficult to access the words. Before 9-11, the Gulf War. So, um, during the Gulf War, a lot of students went home. They they were studying in Israel. I was teaching at a at Or Sameach, and I was teaching at a seminary at the time. A lot of the students, the parents had them come home before the they you knew for months that Iraq was threatening. So a lot of the students went back. Um and especially when the war first started, they many of them got on planes and went back. So uh, there was a student of mine at Orsmeh who approached me about an issue. There was this girl who was at seminary and she was doing really well. And um, she went back because of the Gulf War, met up with an old boyfriend, and she's pregnant. And so the question was, she was doing so well and she was on a track towards a kind of lifestyle that would have meant so much to her. But it'll all be undone if she has the baby. So the question was, could she have an abortion in a situation like that? So I asked her Moshe Shapiro and he goes, no. That's not a, this is not enough of a reason to have an abortion. She has to be at risk. She has to really be at risk. Mental health. Yeah, but it mental health means that she will kill herself. That's what, that if, it, if, it, if it's not a threat to her, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not poskening. I'm not poskening. I asked him. Mm -hmm. If somebody's in this situation, they, they can ask a halacha. Each person should ask their own <clears throat> halachic authority. But he, he didn't feel that that kind of strain was what they were talking about when they, when they allow for mental health. So there you have an example 
of what you know you in in a certain way the person leaves mm -hmm. where they are and there there can be real danger you know to that person when you're out there um so again this is this is something we always have to be thinking about when we leave here wherever you go is here in some way or another but whenever but if you have to leave here wherever here is you have to go out so know that you have to go out and then but also know what the objective is and then once you've accomplished the objective objective be very careful about being greedy just come back do the objective stay on the objective and come back if it's amongst the hardest things because you don't you're not thinking straight anymore over there that's that's part of the problem over there so we used to be told like take on something new before you go back <laughs> like before you go back take on something new like i remember i started wearing a gartel during davening <clears throat> and the i took it on in israel before i came back before i went back to america as a new practice but make make the arrangements for a study partner or to join a class while you're still in Israel. Don't wait till you get to America. These are the things they used to tell us, you know, like once you're there, because again, once you get there and uh, you're, you're no longer able to think entirely clearly. So some of this is like, let's say you're going with, with other soldiers with you yeah. and you would say to them, like, I'll help you. You help me. We got to look out for each other and we got to make sure that we don't do anything stupid out there. We're just going out there to do what we're doing and then we're coming back. And then one of us is, you know, starting to bring back souvenirs and all that other kind of stuff. And the guy's reminding him, remember, just put that stuff down. Remember what we said. We came here for a reason and then we're going back. We're not getting greedy when we're out there. Um, and so it is with an array of things in our lives, emotional, psychological, religious, um, stuff with friendship, stuff with in relationships, all, all this kind of stuff, um, this lesson looms large. So again, in this case, the soldier goes out to battle. He brings back amongst the spoils a new wife. This leads to one thing, which leads to another thing, which is one disaster after another. But it was because he got greedy. He was out there and he got greedy. Did he break any laws doing it? No. But that's, this is not about breaking laws. This is about Discipline. Discipline when you're leaving, when you're out out of where you are. Okay. I'm very grateful. Somehow that meant something to me. <laughs> I don't know. If, it was good. I needed to hear it. Not entirely sure why, but it felt like I needed to hear it. Okay. Be well. And uh, whatever happens in the next hour. Hashem runs the world. God runs the world. We just make effort. We're just asked to make effort. We are not ultimately responsible. We are not. We just try our best and then God runs the world. Don't panic. God runs the world. All right. Be well. Thank you.